Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. So tonight I want to um, riff a little bit about something that came across my email today about from or yesterday from Swami Lakshmanju's people. Swami Lakshmanju was a 20th century teacher of Kashmir Shaivism or Trika Shaivism. And a lot of his satsangs and teachings were recorded and somewhat translated. He, he had a lot of English speaking students, but he himself didn't really speak English all that well. So he has some students from the U.S. who have helped to bring his teachings here. And he also advised a lot of people who were translating the texts of the tradition, who produced some of the best translations that we have. He, he was their go-to person when they wanted to know uh, how to interpret something precisely. So he's uh, considered by some people to be a direct inheritor of Abhinavagupta's tradition, of his lineage, more, more specifically. And Abhinavagupta was, of course, the person who helped to synthesize a bunch of different kinds of tantric practice, different sampradayas, different lineages, and he sort of synthesized those into what we now call Trika Shaivism. You can't say he's really the founder of the tradition, but he's the one that sort of brought it to the table in the form that we know it today. So in this little translation, which is from a teaching on the Tantra Loka, the Tantra Loka is Abhinavagupta's sort of opus where he laid out really the heart of the tradition. It hasn't been translated fully into English up until very, very recently. And now it has, but it, that translation hasn't yet been published. So we hope that it will be soon. <laughs> It was translated into Italian and French before, uh, before it was translated into English. I don't know that they don't get it, that we're number one. <laughs> <laughs> translated here first. Anyway, he's... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So what Swami Lakshmanji is talking about here is two kinds of initiation, what's called diksha. One, uh, the initiation that you get from a teacher, from your guru or some teacher, and another kind of initiation, which is the initiation of spontaneous knowledge or spontaneous wisdom. So what he says basically is that it is good to get initiation from a teacher. And for some people, that's the only kind of initiation that's available to you for some period of time. And that kind of initiation that you get from a teacher, whether it's a formal initiation or some formal ritual happens or whether it's simply the getting of spontaneous knowledge through your association with the teacher, uh, through other forms of transmission, whatever, he says, you know, that is a very good kind of initiation, but it is inferior to the initiation of spontaneous knowledge that you get on your own a way of looking at maturing in your practice, which means not just putting in time, because we all come in, in extremely unique conditions, and some people are going to spend many, many lifetimes practicing before they reach the same point that someone else is going to reach after practicing for seven months. So there's, there's no measure of how long it should take. It doesn't, counting up how long you've been practicing and how many of this and that you've done, really is beside the point <laughs> because whatever happens happens and how long you've put in is just how long you've put in. If you have any measure thinking, Oh, I should have gotten to this point or another point, or I put so much time in, but you know, maybe you've gotten relatively short distance. So nothing to brag about. Anyway, he says that eventually that you are able to 
you know, receive wisdom spontaneously, have spontaneous insight into what? Reality. Reality, into the nature of reality, into the nature of yourself. That's what it's all about. Well, just like we talk about, yeah? When you say spontaneous knowledge, I, are you talking? <laughs> spontaneous knowledge. <laughs> I mean that you are like a finely honed scientific instrument. You have your sen your five senses, what we consider to be the five senses in your mind, which is really a sixth sense. Your senses are your primary tools for investigating reality directly. And when your senses are less limited by karmic conditioning, you will be able to encounter reality on a much more subtle level in a much more subtle way. And you will have spontaneous insight into how things work, what things mean, uh, what you are. These things will just arise in you as incontrovertible understandings spontaneously through the medium of your senses and their communication with wisdom. So that's what he means by spontaneous understanding. He says that the spontaneous understanding that you encounter or experience on your own is superior to initiation. Initiation or transmission, whatever, however it arrives, whether casually or formally, also gives you understanding. But if you can be in a condition where you don't need an external teacher to have that happen, that is superior, he says, because then you're not dependent. Now, we're in this culture at this point in time, there are some people who are very dependent or have bought into the idea that something that someone else does is going to be the key that unlocks enlightenment for you. So we have people running around going to like Shakti pot <clears throat> marathons and whatever they're doing. And, and, there's also this other idea that, okay, maybe you don't think that a teacher can do that for you. And it's so patently obvious if you use your senses and your mind, not a single person ever has ever been caused to become self-realized because of someone else. <laughs> you know, Ma did not cause anyone to become enlightened. She simply gave them an experience of what, it is like to be more realized in an embodied way. She, she's a beacon, and that's how all teachers uh, function, as beacons to show you where you are going. But you have to go there yourself. No one can make you go there, no matter how much they want to. Boy, I'd love to make you guys all enlightened. I mean, first I'd have to be enlightened, but, you know, it's a minor point. But <laughs> because then we can just kick back. <laughs> so, <laughs> the other thing, and, and these are all translated as dialogues between Swami Lakshmanju and his students. So one of the students says, I thought it was all about grace. I thought that we, you know, we were just waiting for grace to kind of touch us on the head. So the other idea, and especially in non-dual traditions, or so-called non-dual traditions, is, okay, maybe you don't believe that the teacher can make you enlightened, but you think, like, Lord Shiva is going to come, and it's all up to God whether or not you become enlightened or not, or what, how much you realize or what you realize. And and Swami Lakshmanji answers in a very clever way. He says, yes, that's true, but you have to make a lot of effort in order to realize that, to get to the point where you know that. <laughs> And there's something even further, which is that there's not actually anything happening. In other words, this is all really just a game, and there is no such thing as unenlightenment. <laughs> so he only tells half the story here, but that's what he's doing, so it's fine. So he says, how do you get yourself in you know, a position to experience this sudden or spontaneous understanding? And he says, awareness, you have to be aware. You have to participate in awareness. You have to see it yourself. 
And this is uh, the two little bits I'm going to read right now. Yes, those of you that know the teachings of Ma know that these are exactly in line with her teachings. Where she always said, blah, 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 here's a teaching, blah, 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 here I am. Yes, fine, it's all extraordinary. But you go now find out for yourself. That is really the essence of the practice is that you go find out for yourself. And not only that you just go find out for yourself, but the, the conviction, the understanding that you have the tools to go find out for yourself already built in. You have your senses, you have your mind, you have wisdom, and your essence nature is already enlightened wisdom. And all you need to do is relax those obscurations of conditioning in order to discover what you always have been. So it all works because of that, right? You actually already know everything that you're going to discover. But as Swami Lakshmanji says, and other people have said, you don't know that you already know that until you go through the whole play, the whole drama of walking a path and doing sadhana and practicing. So the idea which this, his student raises that, you know, we should just sit around and wait for the hand of God to bop us on the head is what's called spiritual bypassing. Right. If Swami Lakshmanji had that word, he would have used it. So he says, awareness, you have to see it yourself. It, it's no good just to see it in somebody else or just to experience it in somebody else. You are yourself the authority. You are absolutely equal to every great enlightened person on the planet because everybody has exactly the same and equal essence nature. So you are already an authority on the nature of the self, the nature of reality. You have just forgotten. You have to see yourself what awareness really is. When he says awareness, he means essence, nature, consciousness. He only has a few words, so he's just using those few words. He says, you have to find out yourself unless you find out for yourself, guru and shastras will be of no help. So for instance, let's say you're studying with a teacher and that teacher is a good teacher and they you know, can give you some hints about where you're going and they can give good teachings and they give you good technique. But then if you have the attitude that it's all up to the teacher, or that you're just going to do your sadhana in a rote way, or that you're just going to sit around half-heartedly, whatever, participating, waiting for, you know, it to come save you. <laughs> if that's your attitude, guru and teachings, shastra, will do you no good. You have to be fully participating in discovering awareness with your own senses, with your own awareness and your senses. That means when you sit down, the number one capacity that you must have is curiosity. And as I've said many times before, the mind is the, is the curiosity sense. And all of your senses have mind. Your smell and your hearing and your tasting and your feeling all have their own aspect of mind or their own curiosity. And because they are all curious, they all have the capacity to reach into awareness with awareness. And this is what it means to be one pointed on that process, to be reaching out with the curiosity of all your senses and having whatever is there come meet you and teach you. So the, what the teacher gives you is a beacon. The teacher can, through some kind of alchemy, give you hints or give you experiences of where you're going. But if you don't go there, it doesn't matter. If you don't go there on your own, if you don't find your way back there on your own, for instance, you move into a new neighborhood and a nice neighbor comes and knocks on the door and says, why don't I show you where the grocery store is? And you say, great. And the, and the neighbor drives you to the grocery store, but then you never try to find your way back there. And you just sit in your house and starve, thinking, wasn't that a great experience at the grocery store? <laughs> <laughs> That's what some of us do with our spiritual practice. You know, we have a teacher and we have some experiences or we do our practice and we have some experiences, but we never try to find our way so that those things become 
a new normal and so that we can explore them and, in, and enlarge on our ability to rest in those experiences and deepen them. So it's not about just counting things off. It's not about you know, chunking out how much time you spend on this and how much time you spend on that. Your daily practice and your practice that you do integrated into your everyday life, if you actually want this whole process that we're undergoing together to bear fruit, then every moment that you're alive, you need to be using your senses and awareness to discover what's really here, using the tools of your practice. That's the actual process. The teacher and the teachings are, like I said the other day, like appliances, right, to help you out. But ultimately, it's you and wisdom relating to each other, right? Your wisdom, your curiosity, your senses relating to reality. Now, what does this mean? When you are working with a teacher, when you are studying, when you are doing practice, you start to subtleize your senses, right? You start to have experiences like we talk about in foundations, that there's the sort of conduct level or physical activity level of life. There's an energetic expression that we have, and there's a wisdom expression, a wisdom body. So almost all of us have a partial experience of our physical experience. Our, even our experience of our senses is muted until things begin to open up. But as they begin to open up, then we start to experience more energetically. And that's when people start saying, oh, my head was tingling or my third eye was tingling or something else was moving or I felt this or I felt that. And that is just the beginning of the opening up of a vast uh, an infinite experience of a kind of vibratory the vibratory quality of life. And that just expands and expands as we keep practicing. And then, not that this is linear, things are happening all at the same time, but then this, this other aspect of, appears, this spontaneous wisdom, where we're just sitting there and all of a sudden we just get what some ritual is actually about, or we suddenly understand something about how reality works or about who we are. And it just comes, and it's just there, and it's incontrovertible. And that becomes our new basis for, for skillful living. Right? We learn how to open our hearts. We find, I'm always saying, you have to open your heart. Well, how do you do that? You do that by subtilizing your senses so that when you go into the center of your chest, there's actually something there to work with. There's energy, there's emotion, there's subtle wisdom, and you're experiencing all of that with your senses and your mind. And so you're able to work with it. So this is what I mean by engaging with curiosity. It's like going into things and teasing out the subtleties of them and going deeper into those subtleties. Uh, let's say you're at a restaurant, right? When you, uh, when you eat a, a hamburger at a fast food joint, which none of you ever do, um, <laughs> You know, you're not like savoring every bite and like trying to like. Te I wonder what spices they use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you're probably just like gulping it down as quickly as you can because it's so gross, yeah. right? That's how most of us are living. But then you get to some other stage of life where you're going out to some fancy restaurant and you really are having this completely new kind of. You're looking at the beautiful design on the plate. You're just, all the different smells are very complex, and then you taste all these subtleties on your tongue. So this is the progression, and then you have to go into it. If you went to a restaurant, you know where the meal is going to cost a hundred bucks, and everything's divinely prepared, and you just went, go, you know, like you were eating a McDonald's hamburger, you're not, the, you know, you've wasted your money. So just like you would open your senses. In a beautiful meal, you have to open your senses and your sadhana and try to taste the subtlety of it. Try to relate yourself to it. Don't make it into an ego thing. Like, I can feel this and I can feel that. That's another thing Swami Lakshmanji says. If you're sitting there and something comes to you and you, th and you think to yourself, oh, how great, I now understand this. Or, oh, how great, I just had this experience. 
it's gone. You're not one pointed anymore. You're just back in your habit pattern of self-referentiality and you're not relating to it anymore. You've now just embalmed it for the purposes of self image formation. So the idea is that something happens and it's like, Oh, it's a, it's a gateway. It's an opening. You go through there, you see what's there. You explore it with your senses and your mind. You try to feel it more deeply. So I can't really be any more explicit than that. That's about as much as one could possibly say about this. Because again, there's no way to give you, you know, steps. But I hope that's some idea of what you need to do. This is what sadhana really is. The techniques are leading you to that gateway into a larger and more subtle experience of, of wisdom, of the vibratory quality of life, of wisdom. And it's up to you to take whatever comes and go into it more, not just stamp it with, I had this experience. Right. And Swami so, mean, Lakshmanji says, this is more important than formal initiation from a teacher. Anybody can go get initiated these days, but what do you do with it? Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings. 